Uh, let me give a brief uh, introduction of, about the speaker. Uh, Professor Rajesh uh, Rajamani obtained his MS and PhD from the University of California at Berkeley in 1991 and 1993, respectively, and is uh, BTEC uh, from IIT Madras in mechanical engineering from in, uh, in the year 1989. He is currently a professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Minnesota. His uh, active interests include sensing and estimation of estimation for autonomous vehicles and other smart structures. Dr. Rajamani has uh, co-authored many journal publications, over 125 papers, and is also co-inventor of uh, 13 pa uh, patent applications. He is the author of a popular book, Vehicle Dynamics and Control, published by Springer. Dr. Rajamani is also a fellow of uh, ASME and has been a recipient of, of the Career Award from NSF in the year 2001. And, and he also received the Outstanding Paper Award from the journal IEEE Transactions on Control System Technology, the uh, Ralph Titor Award from the SAE, and the 2007 Hugo Award from the American Automatic Con uh, Control Council. Several uh, inventions from his laboratory have been commercialized through the startup ventures uh, co-founded by, by industry executives. One of these companies, Inotronics, was recently recognized among the 35 best university startups uh, of the uh, startups of 2016 in a competition co conducted by the US National Council of Entrepreneurial Technology Transfer. Okay. With this, I welcome Dr. Rajesh Rajavan. Thank you. Thank you, Arun, for the introduction. And uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to give this talk. So my talk is titled, Interesting Problems in Estimation and Control on Autonomous Road Vehicles. This is the overview of my talk. Um, so these are all related to transportation problems. Uh, the first topic I'll talk about is uh, addressing traffic congestion. So some new ideas and uh, technologies for addressing traffic congestion. Um, then I'll talk about uh, improving vehicle safety. Uh, so some technologies for uh, improving safety on highways and roads. Uh, and then the last part of the talk is on uh, a project that we are very heavily involved in right now on a special smart instrumented bicycle. OK, so highway congestion is a, is a, is a big problem. So um, uh, there's a, a Texas A&M mobility report that's produced every year. And the uh, statistics, according to that report, uh, they basically show that um, um, uncongested travel is basically less than one third of travel. So two thirds of the time when you're traveling on a highway, the traffic is congested. So it's a pretty serious problem. The cost of congestion is estimated to be $160 billion in 2015. And um, the increase in traffic demand every year exceeds the increase in added capacity. So in other words, uh, you, cannot, you can never build your way out of the congestion problem. You can't build enough lanes or enough new roads to, uh, to solve congestion. Every year, the problem gets just a little bit worse. And one of the reasons for that is, of course, that um, highways and highway lanes are very expensive to build. So the weighted average in the country, in the US, is $30 million per mile per lane of a highway. So it's, it's a uh, huge amount of money that is needed. So you, that's why you would never be able to um, build your way out of congestion. So um, what I'll do is I'll talk about how we can use technology to address traffic congestion. So some of the things that we have worked on are uh, automated highway systems, um, adaptive cruise control systems, and a special type of vehicle that uh, we have built. So uh, first of all, the oldest work that I worked on is uh, automated highway systems. Uh, automated highway systems, um, so this concept was developed at California Path in Berkeley. And uh, the concept is that basically, the cars would travel together tightly packed in a platoon. And by having the cars uh, closely packed together, 
and yet traveling at uh, you know regular highway speeds or higher speeds you would get a very high capacity on highway so you can uh, so then analysis shows that you can get three times the capacity that you would that you get on today's highway so you can get for example you know 7000 uh, or more vehicles per hour per lane okay um, and the good thing about um, uh, automated highway systems is that you can leverage all the roads that already exist. So um, it's a dual mode form of transit in the sense that uh, when you're on the automated highway system, the car is fully automated, it's driving itself. So this occurs in certain crowded parts of the network. And then um, other parts of the road network, it might not be an automated highway system. You just drive the car and uh, you, you, so you drive it yourself. So you can basically go from your garage at your home to any place anywhere, right? So from any point A to any point B, and you'd be leveraging all the roads that already exist. Um, so I used to lead the longitudinal control system team for um, this platoon system demonstration that we gave in 1997. So very, very old story, right? 20 years ago. Uh, so today, autonomous vehicles are very much in the news because uh, Google and many other companies are developing autonomous self-driving cars. Um, what we did was like 20 years ago, so you might find uh, the video to be lower resolution and so on, but we had fully automated cars. Everything was automated, throttle, brakes, steering, and uh, the uh, distance between the cars and the platoon was four meters at steady state. Um, and um, there were eight cars in the platoon. So um, uh, there, is, there were also magnets embedded in each lane. And there were magnetometers on the car. So by measuring the magnetic fields, the, the uh, lateral distance from the center of the lane was measured. And that was used for steering. So uh, you can see uh, the car is being completely uh, self-driven. And here is somebody trying to show off, reading a newspaper and so on. Uh, and uh, so there is an antenna on each car. So there was inter-vehicle communication. The heads-up display, you know, because this is 20 years old, doesn't look that great. but. Uh, it was it was really good for 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 those days and uh, so we gave rights to over a thousand visitors um, over a period of 3 weeks so this included basically um, um, the us secretary of transportation uh, senator barbara boxer and so on so um, Um, so this was a pretty high profile event. Now one of the things about an automated highway system so, um, is that it really needs to be funded and supported by the government to make it, a, to make it actually happen in the real world. That's because um, you know, any private company that tries to develop an automated highway system has to compete with the government because the free roads provided by the government are already there. And so you can never really compete with those roads. So really, it's the, it's the government that needs to come in and, and support and invest in an automated highway system. And therefore, um, work on this uh, technology stopped in 1998 because the government decided to not support AHS research anymore. Okay. So that was one of the traffic congestion technologies that, uh, you know, that is very famous and that we have worked on in the past. Um, so the other uh, uh, type of technology that one might think of using for addressing traffic congestion is uh, adaptive cruise control. Okay, so adaptive cruise control, by now everybody knows about it. And in adaptive cruise control, what happens is the car is um, able to go at constant speed when there is no other preceding car in the road. Uh, but also, if there is a preceding slower moving car in the lane, then the car has a radar and so it's able to maintain a safe distance and follow the preceding car at a safe distance, right? So adaptive cruise control is um, well established. So many, there are many um, cars in the market that have ACC systems on them. So for example, the Distronic ACC system on the Mercedes, the Super Cruise system on the Cadillac and so on. And um, 
in ACC systems, adaptive cruise control systems, when a car follows another car, the distance that it maintains um, is basically proportional to the speed at which it is going. So, the desired spacing is L plus H V, H is called the time gap. So, the time gap is for example, it could be 1 second. So, if you if the time gap is 1 second and you are going at 30 meters per second, then you maintain a 30 meter gap or if you are going at if you have a time gap of 2 seconds, then you maintain a six, 60 meter gap and so on. Okay. So, you maintain a distance proportional speed. So, this is what is typically done on ACC systems. All the cars in the market that have ACC systems use a constant time gap type of distance measurement. Okay. So, now some of the research questions that we addressed here in the uh, adaptive cruise control and its um, uh, possible application for addressing traffic congestion. Um, first, uh, the one of the questions was should ACC systems be designed to maintain a constant time gap between vehicles. So, basically I told you that all the cars in the market they use a constant time gap. So, they maintain a distance proportional to their speed. So, the question being asked here is, is that a good idea? Okay. Uh, is it a good idea to maintain a distance proportional to your speed? The second question, um, if ACC systems are widely deployed, so if a lot of cars on the road have ACC systems on them, um, will that address traffic congestion? So, because you have automation with ACC systems, um, can cars travel closer? Can you get better traffic capacity? Will the traffic congestion problem get, uh, get addressed with ACC being introduced on cars? And so, the answers to these questions are as follows. Um, the answer to whether, AC, whether constant time gap is a good idea, no it is not a good idea. So, obviously that is that is the only interesting answer here right because everybody is already using constant time gap. If I told you it is a good idea, then there is really nothing uh, no, for me to tell you, but uh, it turns out that a constant time gap is a bad idea and I will show you why. In, this, in the animation on the next slide, it basically turns out that the flow rate versus traffic density curve, you know if there are civil engineers here, uh, traffic engineers they know about uh, you know flow rate density curves. Uh, it turns out that uh, the constant time gap basically gives you a negative slope and you know uh, results in instability. I will show you what exactly that means uh, in the next uh, couple of slides. And the question here that we are trying to answer uh, as far as um, addressing traffic congestion, we, uh, you know we want to basically make a significant impact on traffic capacity. Can we double traffic capacity by using ACC systems for example, right. So, that is okay. So, the work we have done um, is as follows. Um, we have a method for um, deciding what the control law and the spacing policy is for adaptive cruise control systems, which is derived from uh, flow density curves. So, these are uh, you know traffic flow versus density and uh, you know so traffic engineers use these kinds of curves and basically uh, you know as the density increases, the flow rate increases until there is a certain critical density after which the flow rate just decreases. Okay. Uh, so, a traffic engineer can basically decide what type of uh, flow density curve he or she would like to get on the highway and what we can do is we can take that flow density curve and we can find a spacing policy and a control algorithm that will provide that flow density curve. So, basically we have a relationship between flow density curves and control algorithms on the car and how, and how those two are related. Um, and these are the two conditions that need to be satisfied by a good ACC system. So, one of the conditions is um, a traffic flow stability condition and so that is basically the dou q by dou rho greater than 0. So, basically the q versus rho. So, this is q flow rate and this is rho the density. So, that slope has got to be positive. Okay. So, that is one of the conditions that is called traffic flow stability and if that condition is not satisfied then small perturbations to the inflow rate. So, when the inflow rate changes, when it goes up by a small amount, that will actually cause the flow rate to drop dramatically. So, that, so that is basically traffic flow stability. Um, then there is one more condition that needs to be satisfied for string stability. And so, string stability basically is related to shock wave propagation. So, uh, 
you know, if there's a perturbation due to one car breaking, how does that propagate, um, uh, you know, for all the cars behind that, the car that breaks, right? Um, does, does, the, does the disturbance amplify as it propagates or does it attenuate? So, that's, so that is related to string stability. So both of these, so you need to design your QRO curve so that you satisfy both of these conditions. And then once you uh, design your QRO curve, then you can find your uh, ACC algorithm to meet these um, criteria, okay. So now what I will show you here is an animation where um, I will basically show you that the constant time gap policy is not stable, meaning if there is a small added inflow rate from a ramp, so um, then that will actually cause traffic to, even if the inflow rate is very small, it will actually cause all traffic to come to a stop. On the other hand, we have a new spacing policy that we, it is one of the spacing policies that, you, that we derived from the Q row curve method that I was just telling you about, how we can derive, we can you know, basically shape a Q row curve and then we can find a control algorithm from it. Um, so I will show you uh, how that system behaves, okay. So the, in the animation you are going to see these two, um, so there is the constant time gap which is what ACC, commercial ACC systems use. Uh, and this is our variable time gap. So both of these animations have exactly the same amount of inflow here, the same number of cars per second that go past this point, okay. Uh, and the inflow rate from the ramp, which is a small inflow rate, is also exactly the same in both these animations. Uh, so the conditions are the same, uh, but you will find that traffic here actually comes to a stop. That is because the um, you know, there is a small inflow rate being added from here and that causes traffic to come to a stop, while here the traffic will keep flowing. So you can see that here now. Um, so you can basically see that uh, here traffic is slowly coming to a stop um, and here traffic keeps flowing. So the, the inflow from the ramp is being accommodated by the cars. Um, so perturbations to the inflow rate are okay uh, as far as this spacing policy and the resulting algorithm, control algorithm are concerned and this basically comes to a stop. So, um, so this basically tells you that a well designed ACC system can lead to better traffic flow and increased traffic capacity. So if you design an ACC system uh, in order to provide better traffic flow, in order to be stable, in order to give you higher capacity, you know. Uh, then it will do that. So you need to actually take that into consideration uh, when you design your ACC system. Um, now what I did not show you in that previous animation, uh, you know, I, ju I just told you that one of them, the traffic, you know, is able to accommodate the inflow rate, keep going, the other one is not able to do so. Uh, but one of the things that needs to be considered also uh, is, uh, um, you know, safety. So safety issues constrain the traffic capacity that can be achieved especially in mixed traffic. So in mixed traffic where both autonomous and manually driven cars, when both of those ex coexist, okay, uh, there is a very significant trade-off between traffic capacity and sa safety. So what we have seen is that when there are manually driven cars, okay, and there is no communication between cars, right, there is each car is autonomous using only its own radar and its own sensors, there is no communication between cars. In that case, when there are manually driven cars existing on the roadway, it is very difficult to achieve significant advances in traffic capacity. So what we have done is we have done worst case um, uh, analysis uh, with uh, uh, manually driven cars to show that it is very, it's very, very difficult to double traffic capacity, you will, uh, it is really not possible basically uh, due to the very uncertain things that manually driven cars can do. They can do, they, you, you can get, um, pretty weird behavior because of manually driven cars. But on the other hand, future uh, vehicle to vehicle and infrastructure to vehicle communication technologies, now those could help address this trade off between safety and capacity. So when there is more wireless communication between cars in the future, I think um, some of these problems will get addressed and traffic cap capacity will be able to uh, be increased, okay. So this is a talk in which I'm, I'm talking about many different technologies, okay. So I, I'm, I'm, not going to, I'm not going into great depth on any one particular topic because we're going to cover many different topics, okay. Okay, so we talked about uh, two types of uh, uh, technologies that might address traffic congestion. One is automated highway systems or platoons 
And then the other is adaptive cruise control and how can you design adaptive cruise control systems to give you better traffic flow. Okay. Now the third topic is um, a narrow tilt controlled traffic friendly commuter vehicle. Okay. So our objective, this was an NSF funded project and uh, our objective here was to develop a traffic friendly and environment friendly commuter vehicle that is basically like a motorcycle, it is a narrow vehicle. So it is basically like a motorcycle and so because it is a motorcycle essentially it is a narrow vehicle, it needs only a 6 feet wide lane instead of a 12 feet wide lane. Okay. So you can basically double capacity because you are having narrower lanes. Okay. Um, and being a motorcycle, it can give you very high fuel economy. So it is very easy to get 100 miles per gallon. Um, now one of the problems with motorcycles is that people do not really want to drive it. So in the US for example, right, people do not really want to drive motorcycles. They feel it is not safe, it is not easy to drive, it is not uh, weather proof and so on. There is lots of problems with motorcycles. Okay. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to develop a vehicle that was you know as safe and as easy to drive as a regular passenger sedan. So basically even though it is a motorcycle, it is going to be as easy to drive. Um, so the key technology that we incorporated in this NSF project was automatic tilt control. So um, automatic, so um, basically if you are if you're, if you're driving straight, this car, this vehicle will balance itself, okay, so it will not roll over. And if you are going around a curve, then the system will automatically figure out what is the trajectory that you are trying to go on, what is your speed, what is the trajectory and how much does it need to tilt into the curve and it will tilt correctly automatically to the correct angle so that the system is stable. So basically you do not have to worry about the tilt stability at all, this is just like a car, you would basically drive it and steer it just like a car and the system would take care of the tilt stability. Okay. So uh, here is somebody else who thought uh, a narrow vehicle was a good idea. So Volkswagen wanted to um, achieve 100 kilometers per liter, that was their fuel economy objective and so they, were, they, they searched around for a good platform solution that would give them that kind of fuel economy and they ended up with a small narrow vehicle. Okay. So this is a narrow vehicle with a two seater platform, basically tandem seating. And uh, you know there if you look on the web uh, there is videos of the CEO of the company driving the vehicle and so on. So it, this was a research prototype, it is not, it's not really sold in the market but there is a, a lot of videos of it. And um, it is uh, one of the uh, things about the, this car is that it provided very agile handling. Okay. Uh, so that was one thing that was very um, uh, pleasantly received by everybody. One of the things you will notice about this vehicle. Um, is that it is very, very short. Okay. So if you are driving on the US highways in this small vehicle, you will be looking at the wheels of all the cars around you because you are at this height here. Yeah. So uh, and the reason for that is basically it is a narrow vehicle, so it had to be made short. What we did is we made a relatively tall narrow commuter vehicle so that you have good visibility on the highway. So you can see uh, you know you, you have SUVs all around you and you still get good visibility on the highway. You can uh, look around and you do not have to worry about you know having a very tall vehicle and rolling over because the system is going to balance itself. Okay. So this is a road just outside um, uh, you know we are very close to mechanical engineering and uh, you know it is right outside electrical engineering actually called Union Street and uh, this is Sam driving the car there. I um, will show you some videos of it. Uh, but le let us talk for a couple of minutes on the control system problem for this narrow commuter vehicle. Okay. So what is the control system objective? The control system objective is to balance the car. Yeah. And uh, what kind of actuation will you use for doing that? Um, you can use an actuator in the suspension, so you can use a DC motor or other motor in the suspension, so that could be one actuator. Okay. Or you can use steering tilt control. So um, you can steer, so your steering is going to cause tilting as well. Okay. Um, it turns out that if you use direct tilt control, you need a really big actuator, especially at high speeds. So at high speeds, V square over R, the centripetal force is really high. Yeah. So it turns out you need a lot of torque um, 
on the other hand because the tilt angle is high and um, at low speeds you can you can use a motor in the suspension at high speeds it is better to use a steering tilt control okay. So basically you need you will use steering to control tilt of course um, how can you use steering to control tilt because steering needs it needs to be used by the driver for staying in the lane and so on right. Um, so this is a very interesting control problem where there is only one control input which is the steering and there is two people who use it right the driver wants to use it to stay in the lane to make a lane change and so on and the system wants to use it to do tilt control. So you want to achieve both the objectives with one control input and um, so it turns out so again we won't have time to go into great detail on this but it turns out that if you actually try to control only the tilt okay you can you, you can uh, and you define correctly what the tilt angle should be for different your aids then you can actually achieve control of both variables you can you can basically control tilt and also control the yaw rate okay. Um, on the other hand if you directly try to control yaw rate you would not succeed you would never be able to you would never tilt into the curve if you if you try to make your um, um, yaw rate match what the driver is trying to uh, ask for you would, that, that would not actually work okay. So there are, so what you need to do is you just need to be clever about how exactly you implement this okay and uh, so what we did is we Im implemented both steering tilt control and direct tilt control. So this is the actuator based and this is the steer by wire based um, uh, so a combined system that works at different speeds basically and uh, you know this is a few years old that is why the video is not. So um, Sam actually works in uh, works in Apple uh, and he is uh, just started doing uh, some work related to autonomous vehicles at Apple. Um, so um, so uh, that completes my uh, discussion of traffic congestion technologies you know what type so I, we talked about three technologies right automated highway systems, um, adaptive cruise control and narrow tilt control vehicles okay. So then we will move on to the next topic um, sensing and estimation for uh, safety. So, um, so you know that um, there are a lot of traffic accidents I think in, in India it is like a more than 100,000 uh, uh, people killed every year in the US it is about 35,000 people um, that die in traffic accidents every year. Uh, so that is a really huge number financial costs 3 percent of world GDP and that is basically over 1 trillion dollars each year okay. So now uh, one of the things about uh, accidents is that over 90 percent of accidents happen because of human error. So you know nobody really has an accident because the brakes on the car failed or you know the steering wheel came off right nothing like that. So almost all accidents happen because somebody made a mistake. So 90 over 90 percent of accidents happen because of human error and therefore the hope is that as you have more and more automation and uh, you you decrease the burden of the driver um, then uh, you are going to have very few accidents in the future okay. So um, there is a, a number of active safety systems that have been developed by automotive companies um, and uh, you know electronic stability control rollover prevention and so on and so we have also worked um, uh, on a number of these technologies um, especially a couple of technologies that where we have had a good impact on. Uh, but today what I am going to do is I am going to talk about only two uh, topics one is nonlinear observer design and the other is magnetic signature analysis for 
imminent collision prediction. Okay. So, nonlinear observer design. Um, so, in the in the last few years, uh, we have published a number of papers on uh, observer design for nonlinear systems. So, in the next couple of slides, I will just show you um, one example result, you know the kind of uh, uh, work that we do. So, um, this is one paper uh, where um, we designed a, a nonlinear observer that is applicable to a broad class of nonlinear systems. Okay. So, uh, this is the uh, class of systems we are looking at. Right. So, x dot is equal to a x plus g gamma of x. So, there is this nonlinearity here and there is uh, an unknown input here and the measurement is y is equal to c x and there is nonlinearity in the measurement equation as well. Um, and um, you know w is actually a vector. So, you have you can have different disturbances in the process dynamics and in the measurement equation. Okay. And uh, you can uh, uh, write the, uh, the nonlinearity in the process dynamics uh, using these matrices H which uh, can be configured in many different ways and so that, that actually that turns out to be a, a really great uh, degree of freedom. The way you choose H um, actually helps your observer design process. Um, so, again the output has got nonlinearity as well. Uh, so, we allow for nonlinear uh, equation uh, uh, functions in both the process and the output and um, the nonlinear functions gamma and g they can be one of three different types. Uh, so, they can either be globally Lipschitz. Okay. So, basically gamma of x minus gamma of x hat is bounded by this norm. So, that is the global Lipschitz condition. right? So, you can have a globally Lipschitz nonlinear function or you can have a bounded Jacobian function. Okay. So, um, upper and lower bounds on each of the elements in the Jacobian matrix. Um, or you can have a just a non decreasing a monotonic or a non decreasing function. So, basically you can see that this is a non decreasing function. So, if, if a is bigger than b then gamma of a is bigger than gamma of b essentially. So, if you have a non decreasing. So, um, what we have done essentially is we have de developed a method that works for all these three types of nonlinearity. So, we basically avoid trade offs between feasibility and usability. So, what happens is um, you know so some people have results only for monotonic nonlinear systems others have uh, results for boundary Jacobian systems and so on. And so there is always a trade off between feasibility and usability in these results. Um, so, in the observer is basically um, you know replicates the state equation, uh, but there is injection of um, uh, estimation error in a number of places. So, um, so, there is this feedback term here L times y minus y hat. So, this is the Lune, this is the Lunberger type of uh, feedback right in the observer equation, but there is also uh, y minus c x hat the same estimation error uh, feedback output estimation error feedback is also inside this nonlinear function and it is also inside this nonlinear function. Okay. So, the nonlinear function the output. So, uh, there is essentially three different observer gains. L k and m. So, it is a 3 degree of freedom observer. Uh, the control input is not important here. So, the control input is can be there right. We always assume the control input is known. So, it, the, the fact that it is there. Between state and input as long as the input is known that is ok. Um, ok. So, um, so, in this so, this is the paper uh, that basically contains this uh, this observer that I am talking to uh, tell them telling you about. Uh, so, this was just published recently in, in Automatica and um, so, what we have done. Uh, so, I am not presenting the uh, the LMIs here. Okay. So, you can just go and look at the paper. Uh, essentially, what we have done is uh, you know we have developed uh, observer design method that is applicable to a broad range of systems. Okay. So, it is one of the very few methods that allows uh, basically nonlinear functions in both the system dynamics and in the output equation and allows uh, monotonic uh, nonlinear functions Lipschitz as well as bounded Jacobian. And there is more degrees of freedom in the observer. Uh, so, there is basically a Leonberger like observer gain and additional output error feedback inside both nonlinear functions. And there is also additional degrees of freedom 
from choice of multiplier matrices in nonlinear functions. Okay, so there is the H matrices that I was talking to you about. Those are um, you know one set of degrees of freedom as well. And um, so we have shown that our results uh, in this paper are less conservative than all published results. So we looked at results by uh, Kristik and Kokotovich, by Achikmis and Carles, by Zemuk and so on. And we showed that so they've done developed observer design uh, results for specific classes of nonlinear systems. And what we showed is that our method kind of applies to all their uh, all their systems. Um, and so in general we do quite a bit of work on nonlinear observer design. Um, so one of the other um, um, topics we have worked on is a um, um, sequential LMI approach for uh, doing BMI based observer design. Okay. So um, a BMI a bilinear matrix inequality you know would look something like this. So essentially a bilinear matrix inequality if you only had these first two terms then it be, this would be an LMI, this would be a linear matrix inequality. So basically you know the, these are the decision variables, the x's are the decision variables they are trying to find right. So these two together would be an LMI, but now you have this product of x and y, there are no quadratic terms, but the product terms and so that makes it a BMI uh, and this uh, you know if, if you have an LMI, there is an LMI toolbox in MATLAB right and you can use the toolbox and it will give you a solution, there is the, there are often numerical problems there, but you can mostly find a solution using the LMI toolbox. Um, but finding a solution to a BMI is a NP hard problem in general and so in this paper uh, that um, you know was also published very recently, we basically found a new solution method to a BMI. So basically we apply a, con a convex concave decomposition and a sequential LMI technique to find a solution to the BMI and we do not need a feasible solution to start with which is what all previous public publications on BMI solutions they need a feasible solution to start with and so we do not we do not need that. Um, okay. So I think I am going to run out of time so I will move on to some other. So, uh, so let us talk about applications of, uh, of some of these observer design techniques. Okay. Um, so, um, one of the applications we worked on is uh, mag magnetic signature analysis for imminent crash prediction. Okay. So, um, every car has an inherent magnetic signature, right. So, you know that for example, people um, you know uh, use inductive loops to count the number of cars that are going past a point in the road, right. So, that is because a car is magnetic, okay. And so, every car is ferromagnetic, uh, it has a magnetic field. And uh, what we showed is that we can actually model the magnetic field around a car. We can model how the magnetic field varies as a function of position around the car. And therefore, by using that model, we can find position of, of another car close to your car. So that can be used for um, imminent collision prediction. So this is not um, collision prevention type of application, you know it is not. So, for collision prevention you use um, radar and laser and so on those types of sensors right, but collision when you have a, a imminent collision basically an unavoidable imminent collision. So, there is some other car very close to you, now that that type of scenario you can detect by using magnetic sensors and by using models of the magnetic field of each car. So, here for example, what we did is uh, you know we just use we, we model a car with dipoles uh, you know this is a little bit distorted here in the projection, but um, um, uh, we basically integrate uh, the magnetic field due to dipoles um, you know in this volume and we can show that um, the magnetic field in the longitudinal direction. So, this is a car and this is the longitudinal direction the magnetic field variation along the longitudinal direction is given by P over x plus q. So, basically the magnetic field varies inversely as x okay so now um, once you have a model like this so we have show, so this model works for all kinds of cars so we've uh, you know here's a table that shows you that it essentially holds you know this this model holds for uh, you know a few different cars the p and the q parameters are different for different cars but um, uh, the model holds now um, from this equation you can see that by measuring the magnetic field you can find x right you can basically invert this equation and if you measure the magnetic field 
you can find the distance to the car yeah but what is the problem what do you what do you think would would prevent you if some other car came close to you what would what would prevent you from finding the position from this equation what would prevent you is you would need to know all the parameters so you need to know the p and the q right and so that would depend on which car you are encountering right so unless you made an appointment to have a crash you won't know which car uh, you are going to encounter right and so uh, you won't how would you actually find the distance. Um, so what we do is um, we essentially use redundant sensors on one sensor board so um, uh, for the longitudinal problem two sensors are enough for other two dimensional problems you know you need more sensors but basically by using redundant sensors and by having known distances between the redundant sensors. So you have two magnetic sensors on a sensor board you know what the distance is between those two sensors. So you, you so you have some expectation of the relationship between the magnetic fields that those two sensors are going to see because you know the distances between those sensors. So, um, so by using redundant magnetic sensors um, you can estimate not only the distance but also the parameters. So the parameters are unknown and you can estimate the parameters in addition to estimating the distance okay. So, uh, so we have done uh, experiments uh, for uh, with different types of cars and um, you know we have published two different papers one on 2D estimation and one on longitudinal uh, you, you basically collision prediction for two different types of applications. Um, okay, now here is a mo is a more commercial application. Okay, so um, the very same concept that I was talking uh, talk, talking to you about using redundant magnetic sensors to find distance to, or to find position. Um, so that can also be used for actuators. So hydraulic actuators, pneumatic actuators, IC engines, spool valves. So all kinds of applications that involve a piston moving inside a cylinder. Right. So a piston moving inside a cylinder, hydraulic actuators, pneumatic actuators, all of them have pistons moving inside cylinders. So um, this technology in which you use magnetic sensors can be used for finding the position of the piston inside the cylinder. So you have a non-contacting, non-intrusive method of estimating the position of the piston. And so you can actually find the position of the piston with sub-millimeter accuracy. Um, so here is a um, here is a test rig and I will show you a video on the next slide. Uh, so this is our sensor, this is a newer generation of the sensor. Um, so it is a non-contacting sensor, the piston is inside this pneumatic actuator. Uh, this is an LVDT, so this is a, a you know a accurate uh, standard LVDT that is used for position measurement. It needs to be connected to the object whose position you want to measure. So, uh, so this LVDT is connected to the, what we did is we basically mounted a plate on the piston rod and then we connected the LVDT to the to the plate and so as the piston moves the LVDT is going to see the movement and uh, so that is going to be a reference sensor. So we are going to compare our measurements and estimates with the LVDT estimates okay. Um, so what you will see here is, um, so Inatronics is the company that we have launched for commercializing this sensor and uh, so what you will see in this, uh, I do not know if this is going to. Okay. So what you will see in this video is the same setup that I showed you earlier. So here is our sensor and here is the reference LVDD. There is a ruler on the table so you can see what the real position is. Um, and here you can see the LVDT and our sensor and you can see estimates of both. Um, and you can see that our estimates um, they track the LVDT uh, measurements quite accurately. So um, and, and they can do that at high bandwidth as well. Okay. Um, so the, the advantage of our sensor essentially right compared to this other sensor is this ne sensor needs to be connected to the piston this one does not need to be connected also this is a $500 sensor and this is a $50 sensor. So uh, you know the, our estimated market price even though we say it is $100 right now but our estimated market price is $50. Um, so. Um, we have a startup company called uh, Inatronics and so this company um, has a CEO called Mike Gust who uh, retired from um, Daikin. He was director of engineering at Eaton Hydraulics and then VP of engineering at Daikin uh, which is a big company in Minnesota. Um, so he is uh, running the company and uh, myself and him are co-founders of the company. Um, 
and the key person in the company is uh, Ryan Matson, who's our uh, who's my PhD student, um, and. Uh, so we have launched a company, we have a SBIR phase, uh, phase one uh, proposal that we have won and we have also uh, received angel investor funding um, and uh, essentially uh, we have a prototype sensors. So really what we are doing is uh, we are looking for a customer. A customer is basically looking for an OEM customer. So we want a big company like Caterpillar or CNH, you know, some such company to place an order with us and uh, that would basically get our company going. Okay. Uh, other applications of observer design, uh, you know, I've, I, I, some of you have talked to me, you have seen that, uh, so some of the things we have worked on, uh, we have worked on slip angle estimation, we have done a lot of work on tire road friction coefficient estimation for um, snow plows as well as cars. So on snow plows, we, we estimate the, fr the friction coefficient of the road so that we can control how much salt is applied to the road by the snow plow. And we have also done uh, observer design for preventing trip rollovers. So the rollover technologies that are rollover prevention technologies that are available are for untripped rollovers. You know, meaning if a car is going too fast around a curve, it can roll over. And um, so the technologies that are sold are typically for untripped rollovers. Uh, you know, rollovers that happen purely because of lateral acceleration. Uh, but the other types of rollovers are more common. So the trip rollovers are where you know you go over a bump, right? You hit a curb, and so those kinds of uh, external inputs that cause tripping, they are they are much more responsible for um, rollovers. And so we've uh, worked on unknown input estimation for preventing trip rollovers. And so that brings me to the to the last topic of my talk: a smart bicycle with a novel collision avoidance system. So this is a project that we're working on uh, now, and um, what we are doing here is developing a smart sensor system for a bicycle. Okay, so the sensors on the bicycle will track all the nearby cars, all the cars that are near the bicycle, and it will predict the danger of a collision. And if there is a danger of a collision, our initial warning system is basically uh, audio-visual warning. So we basically provide a horn-like sound uh, and a visual signal to the car so that the motorist in the car can see the bicycle and so we make, we're making the motorist aware of the presence of the bicycle. Okay. So some of the uh, sensors and uh, estimation system we are working on are uh, low density LIDAR sensor, a custom sonar sensor that we have developed and a special rear rotating laser sensor. So I'll talk about these. Now um, you might ask, um, you know, what is difficult about this because on a so all the autonomous cars in the road are already trying to track other, um, other uh, cars, right? Um, but on a bicycle, there is really a special challenge. So first of all, the cost allowed on a bicycle is very low. So uh, we have set ourselves a target of less than $500, and these are at retail prices. So the sensor systems that we, and, and the electronics that we are allowed to use on the bicycle should cost less than $500, okay? Um, so compare that with what the Google's uh, sensor costs, okay? So this Velodyne sensor, uh, this is apparently going to drop in price, but right now it's $80,000, okay? Um, so we have a, a significant constraint in terms of cost and also size and weight. At the same time, we have to track more complex maneuvers. So on a car, when you're driving on a highway, you are basically looking at all the other cars ahead of you, right? You use a radar or a laser sensor. Um, so, um, um, on a bicycle, on the other hand, you have much more complex traffic because you are driving on urban roads, you're driving through traffic intersections. So, the, on a traffic intersection, you have cross traffic, you have cars that turn left, cars that turn right, and all kinds of other things going on. So, you have a very complex uh, traffic scenario that you're trying to track, okay? Um, so one of the sensor systems, I won't talk about this one, but we've basically developed a custom sonar sensor uh, with one transmitter and two receivers for, um, for a side distance measurement. So sonar sensors are very cheap, you know, they're less than $20, uh, so very inexpensive. Uh, I'll talk about this particular system here. So one of the systems we have developed is a rear collision prevention system. So a, um, for this, what we use is we use this laser sensor. So this, this laser sensor is uh, $89, a very inexpensive laser sensor. 
uh, it has a thin beam and um, so it has a very thin beam and wherever you orient the laser sensor it is going to measure the distance to any object in that orientation in that direction basically okay. So because it has a very thin laser beam and it is also a slow sensor meaning you know it is not going to give you very very rapid update so that you can scan the road with it you know. Uh, so because of that there are some special challenges yeah. So what we do is um, we mount the oops we mount the laser sensor on a on a rotating platform and we control the orientation on the laser sensor. So, um, so this is looking at cars behind the bicycle and as the as the car behind the bicycle moves longitudinally or laterally the orientation of the laser sensor needs to be controlled so as to track so, so, so that you can keep tracking the vehicle as it moves. So there is a lot of signal processing that um, you know we have to um, do density based clustering to reject outliers to detect a car and so on but we will not talk about those things. This is just a simple animation that shows you that if you did open loop scanning your system would not work very well. So this is where the laser sensor is just doing open loop scanning right it is just scanning the whole road um, and if you uh, so when you do this you can see that you get very sparse measurements only occasionally you get a reading from the car and so uh, you can see the, what the data looks like right it is you know you have sparse data because you only get occasional readings. Um, so what we do instead is once we detect a car once we recognize that what we are tracking is a car what we have measured is a car then we track the right corner of the car okay and, and uh, so what we, we do that using receding horizon um, optimization. So we, we use receding horizon optimization to do the control of the orientation of the laser sensor. So we control the orientation to track this point um, and then we are we also use a multiple model approach. So this is now changed this is slightly old. Um, so now we, we use a nonlinear observer uh, but earlier we used a multiple model approach for um, estimating the states of the car right. So we need to do estimation we need to know where the car is what are the what is the position velocity angular orientation and so on right. So we need to track the car and then we also need to uh, control the orientation of the laser sensor um, based on those estimates. Um, and so here this is an animation. So here you can see that uh, you know the system is tracking the right corner continuously right. So because it is tracking the right corner you get estimates that are continuous that are uh, not sparse basically okay. That is a topic that we have looked at as well um, you know um, more from a research point of view uh, but as far as as far as this uh, this system we are, we are looking at one car because uh, we essentially the car is going the, the car right behind the bicycle either right behind or in the lane ne right next to the bicycle that is the one that is important um, okay. So, uh, so we have implemented these uh, systems on a bicycle and uh, so you this is basically the laser sensor and this is the, the motor that is controlling the laser sensor. So I uh, will show you a couple of videos uh, so, uh, so all of the system is implemented uh, on a TNC microcontroller on the on the bicycle and uh, in this particular video this video is taken at the height of the laser sensor what you will see is that the laser sensor is uh, initially doing scanning and then it detects a car it tracks the car and follows the car. So now it's tracking the car. You see the scanning and so follows the car. Um, here's a couple of other videos. In this in this particular video, um, there is a vehicle that is coming behind the bicycle and it passes too close to the bicycle. And because it's too close, even though it's not turning towards the bicycle, but it's too close to the bicycle, so a warning is provided. Um, This is louder than it actually is, uh, but here is another uh, video in which uh, the car actually turns towards the bicycle and receives a warning. 
you can see the you can see the laser sensor and then when the car turns towards the bicycle you know a warning is provided i think the audio here is amplifying the sound so um so our newer project on this topic is basically it's um, uh, funded by NSF and we have a collaborator which is a, a bicycle company in Minnesota called Quality Bicycle Products. It's actually a very big company. It's one of the biggest bicycle companies in the world. And um, so they are collaborating with us and um, we, are doing, we are doing a lot of technology development. We're basically developing all the systems on the bicycle in order to track all the cars. Um, on the road and provide warning. And then um, the last part of our project is about a field operational test. So uh, we have a field operational test in which um, uh, you know, 10 employees from quality bicycle products will ride the bicycles for uh, six months. And so basically they will ride it to work every day and we'll collect all the data and we'll see whether the system works, how well does it, does it reduce the number of near collisions and how, uh, how well does it perform and so on, okay. So that, uh, you know, brings me to the end of the talk. Uh, um, so I'd like to thank our sponsors. So a lot of our funding has come from uh, NSF and different transportation agencies as well as a number of different companies. Uh, and, uh, you know, all the work in the, all of these projects is obviously done not by me but by uh, other people in the lab. So Lee Alexander has been with me for the last 10 years and uh, he's really invaluable. So he's the one who built the narrow commuter vehicle for example for us and so on. So uh, he's helped us with, uh, with building a lot of different things in the lab. Um, so with that I'll stop and, um, and uh, I'll take questions. Yeah. magnetic field is one of them. So as your orientation changes, uh, you know, your, there is a different bias due to Earth's magnetic field. So that is a parameter that you need to keep uh, adapting on. Uh, how do you measure that? What is the sensor? How do you measure it? So we estimate it basically. So we, uh, we have redundant sensors on a sensor board. So we, uh, these are magnetic sensors. So, um, you know, so one of the types of sensors, we, so we use AMR, GMR or TMR type of sensors. So AMR sensors are the least expensive anisotropic magnetoresistive sensors. So they typically cost a few dollars each sensor. So they're very, very cheap essentially. Uh, in fact, you can even get digital sensors. Each sensor is only four dollars and it not only measures three axes of magnetic field, but it also does all the digitization and the amplification and gives you a digital value. So it's a, you know, a very nice uh, solution that is available. You can just buy it and use it. That's the sensor that measures magnetic field. So you use three of those sensors and you're measuring three axes from each of them. So you have nine different signals that you get. So you have a lot of, you have a lot of data essentially. You have line, nine different magnetic signals that you measure. And so you have to figure out how to use these magnetic signals you know, to adapt on parameters as well as find uh, the distance. So if you use iron and other materials, they already have a magnetic uh, bias in them. So that, is that also part of that cube? Yeah. So, um, so for example, let's say you're trying to measure the distance to some ferromagnetic object, okay? But you're also going to be influenced by the ferromagnetic objects around you, other ferromagnetic. So those other ferromagnetic objects, right, uh, they will give you a bias. So that's why you'll have the Q term. So you'll have the Earth's magnetic field and you'll also have other objects around you. So you have to adaptively estimate again and again. You are, yeah, it's a, it's a continuous estimator. Second, uh, first, uh, like you're talking about uh, autonomous cars. Is it possible, like in, for example, in a country like India, I have a dedicated link and I'm going to uh, have autonomous, quote unquote, if possible, say government and all that gives permission. Is it possible to run 
an autonomous uh, set of taxis or cars in, in one, then what sort of sensors would be needed? Yeah, so, uh, you know, that's of course the best scenario. So if you, uh, if you have a separate lane for only autonomous cars, with no other, with no manually driven cars, uh, you know, or uh, inadequately equipped cars, you, you have only instrumented, uh, you know, cars fully automated that are on that lane. That's of course the best scenario. And uh, certainly, you know, you can have autonomous cars in that lane. And uh, if you want the cars to operate in a platoon, if you want them to be tightly packed and get high traffic capacity, um, then you need wireless communication between the cars and the platoon. So there's a lot of work that's been done on what kind of wireless communication you need. You know, so typically what they ask for is that, you know, the lead car of the platoon should communicate its acceleration and velocity to all the other cars in the platoon, along with preceding car. So each car needs to get information from the lead car and from its preceding car. That's the kind of connectivity you need. Yeah. Yeah, so I didn't talk about, I only talked about the, the rear laser sensor and tracking of rear cars, um, but we also have a sensor on the front of the bicycle. And so there we need a, a much wider range. Um, and um, so we have, we, have, we have some different technologies for that. I mean, computational cost is not important as long as, you know, depends. I mean, obviously, you can't put a supercomputer on the bicycle, right? Yes, but, yes, yes. you know, yeah, as long as it works on a Teensy or a Raspberry Pi, we are happy with that. Oh, so to take yeah, yeah. I mean, those are the only things we can use. So we can't really use something that is. Yeah, I don't think that's a problem. I mean, right now we don't have an integrated system. So we have like two different bicycles, one that's doing the forward, um, uh, you know, tracking part and then one that's doing the rear collision and, the, and then the side. Um, so we don't really have an integrated system yet. But yeah, I don't think that's a problem. And yeah, I mean, also, even if you want to have two, two, uh, two Teensies or two Raspberry Pis, that's not expensive either. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, if you have one front wheel and two rear wheels, right, uh, so that's called an understeered vehicle. An understeered vehicle, right, as you go at um, higher and higher speed, you have more steering. Uh, so people would like to, the best car is neutral steering, where you don't have to change your steering angle as you go at different speeds. Um, and uh, oversteered is where, you know, you actually need to reduce your uh, steering angle, so uh, as you go at higher speeds. Um, so if you have two wheels in the front and one at the back, as opposed to the other way, uh, then you're closer to neutral steering. Um, while if you, ha you know, if you had one wheel in the front, then you'd be an understeered vehicle. So this is a more agile, basically. I think uh, maybe what is needed on an auto rickshaw is that it shouldn't roll over. I mean, when in my uh, long time ago, uh, you know, uh, when I was very young, um, we, I was in an auto rickshaw that just fell over. So the driver was just going around, a, you know, just going on a curve on the road, and the auto rickshaw just fell over. So we, you know, there were three of us in the car. We all fell. We got a little bit hurt, and so on. So I think a car auto rickshaw is very unstable. It can easily fall. Yeah, so uh, 
you know, um, that's what uh, the paper is all about and uh, how you, so basically this, uh, we use Lyapunov functions, uh, you know, Lyapunov function candidates and uh, uh, the assumptions that we make on the nonlinear functions, right, uh, those essentially dictate what types of LMIs need to be satisfied to uh, make the system stable. I think if there are any other questions, so you can. I'm happy to answer more questions, though. Yeah, please uh, accept this momento from the organizers. Thank you.